الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما كان لبشر أن يأتيه الله الكتاب والحكم والنبوة ثم يقول للناس كونوا عبادا لي من دون الله ولكن كونوا ربانيين بما كنتم تعلمون الكتاب وبما كنتم تدرسون صدق الله العظيم In the previous session we were talking about the proofs about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being the prophet of Allah and we talked about the general rule of knowing about anyone and determining about any person who claims to be a prophet that what are the methods by which we can confirm the truthfulness of this person and be sure that whatever he's claiming and as he's claiming to be receiving revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if it is true or not. We need to remember this that all of this is not applicable to anyone after the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was khatamun nabiyyin. He was the last and the seal of all prophets and messengers. So there is no prophet, no messenger after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The only reason we want to know this because of number one, when people question us about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that how do you know if he was a true messenger or not? Number two, when we are discussing it with those who believe in any of the previous prophets. So by these categories or by these criterias, we can set a common ground between them and us and find out that, okay, if you believe in Ibrahim as a prophet of Allah, tell us, why do you believe in Ibrahim as a prophet of Allah? What makes you believe that Ibrahim was truly a prophet of Allah? What makes you believe that Ismail was a prophet of Allah? What are the proofs under which you believe that Musa was a prophet of Allah? And if you have proofs about the prophethood of those prophets, and you tell us what is the criteria of believing in those people as prophets and messengers, then we will bring you similar proofs about the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This will set the common ground. Otherwise, a lot of time what happens is, people question us. They tell us, prove to me that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was a messenger of Allah. And then we present a proof. And right away the person would deny the proof. And denying the proof will be in one of the two different ways. Number one, he will just make fun of it. Oh, how is it possible? This is not possible that someone would do something like this. That's impossible. And right there you're stuck. And it looks like really he, he the person makes fun of you and you are being insulted in such a way where you're trying, no, 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 please believe me that what I'm saying is true. And everyone is just laughing at you. So that person corners you in this bad situation where he makes you say something and then he makes fun of it. This is one way of rejecting it. The other way of rejecting it is that the person would say that okay, even if the person has seen Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam did perform this miracle, what does that mean? I mean, that doesn't make him a prophet. If he performed this miracle, that doesn't make him a prophet because I, there are other people who perform similar type of things that were not prophets. People who are not prophets, they did things like that. And not necessarily that he will be able to present an example of exact similar miracles, but extraordinary things, things that human being cannot do. And he would present those examples and then try to prove that miracles mean nothing. So this is why we want to set a common ground. Tell the person that rather than me trying to prove the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to you, you tell me what makes a person a prophet. Do you believe in any of the prophets? And if the person believes in any of the prophets, then 
Why do you believe in that person as a prophet? What makes that person to be a prophet? Also, sometimes you find that they use another method of rejecting the, prophets, the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is, you present them a proof. Most probably it would be a miracle or a prophecy. Right away, this person will not even talk about it. He would ignore totally what you have said about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed this great miracle. And you really presented it with a big hope that he has no answer to it. And in reality, he may not even have an answer in his mind to that. What he's going to do is, he would present something totally different, like an objection against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Oh yeah, okay. J- j- tell me, why Islam allows slavery? Right away, he changed the subject. First thing, he asked you to prove why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a prophet. As soon as he presented a proof, he ignores whatever you said totally. And he goes off totally to another subject. How come Islam approves of uh, slavery? And now you try to prove slavery in Islam. And as soon as you're done with your beautiful explanation, he says, yeah, yeah, but how come Islam allows this? How come more than, marrying more than one is allowed in Islam? Now, right away. Now, he is putting you in a situation where you are just continuously trying to defend yourself and defend your deen, and he is just objecting, objection upon objections. That's all he's doing, and he's enjoying it. That's not a good way of inviting people to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The good way of inviting people is that let that person set the common ground. Let that person tell us that why Musa salam was a prophet. If this person says Musa salam was a prophet because he was able to show people his shiny hand, and this is a miracle that is known by everyone, that he puts his hand in his underarm and he brings it out, he pulls it out, and his hand, and his hand is shining. If that is the reason why Musa salam was a prophet, then tell me, was Ibrahim salam a prophet? And if it is yes, tell him, Ibrahim salam never did that. Ismail salam didn't do it. So no one other than Musa salam did it, so there was only one prophet throughout the history of the world. So finally, the person has to come to a common, common ground, and that is, Ibrahim Musa salam was a prophet, not because that is specific miracle, because of generally performing a miracle. Because he showed people miracles. Anyway, the point is that we want to set common ground. That's the only example that I'm mentioning. I'm not talking in detail about miracles. We'll talk about it later on, inshallah, once that time would come. But at this time, all I'm saying is we need to know these things because we would like to set common grounds in order for us to explain the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and even many times for our souls. To understand the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sometimes people can confuse us about our faith very easily, because it's very weak. We don't have proper information about it. And what happens is, as, as you pre- present a miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, someone says, yeah, I saw a guy who was doing this thing, and that was something, extraordinary thing the person had performed, and he presents that to you, and he says, look, this looks like a miracle too. Do you believe in that person as a prophet? And we don't know what to say. Or someone would present a magician to us. Just like say for example, at the time of Musa alayhi salatu was salam, if before that challenge, when Musa alayhi salatu was salam, challenged those people, and they were in the field, and finally they were defeated, but before that scene, just take your memory back now, and just imagine when Musa alayhi salam puts the stick on the ground and turns into a snake. Fir'aun brings a lot of magicians who put their robes and their sticks on the ground and they turn into a snake. Now, to a common person over there, what's the difference? Musa is doing it and these people are doing it too. We saw them with our own eyes doing exact same thing as Musa is doing it. A common man cannot differentiate between the two. Finally, when they came into the field, and now they see that Musa والسلام, is doing something that they cannot do. And this is always the situation with miracles. Inshallah, we'll talk in detail about that. That no one can defeat the miracles at that time. 
And the second, the major difference was, the magicians are doing it through their knowledge that they have about their magic. Musa salam doesn't even know how it's happening. All he knows is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, put the stick on the ground and it will turn into a snake. He doesn't know how it happens. But those people, they know how to do it. This is a major difference that people don't normally don't realize. That once, on one hand, it's a science. It's something that people have learned. On the other hand, it's being done by a person who says, I don't know how to do it. This is what he says. He says, I don't know how to do it. It just happens. Which means, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the doer. And the other person claims, no, I'm doing it. I know how to do it. And this is why Musa alayhi salatu was salam, first time when he saw his own stick turn into a snake, he was afraid of it. A magician is never afraid of his own stick. But Musa alayhi salam was afraid of his own stick that turned into a snake. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, go back, pick it up. Not only this, now when Musa alayhi salatu was salam, so all of these magicians putting their sticks on the ground, turning into snake, he didn't know what's going to happen next. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, فَوْحَيْنَا إِلَى مُوسَىٰ Allah says, I told him, put your stick down, that's all. As soon as he puts it down, this stick of Musa alayhi salam that turned into snake, eats up all the other snakes over there. Now, see the difference between mu'jiz and miracle? That their sticks, all they can do is, the stick turns into snake and keep on moving like a snake. But the stick of Musa alayhi salam, it swallows all of those snakes. And finally when he picks it up, it's only a stick. Where did, where did all of those sticks go? They disappeared. But where? Where did they go? The magicians could not do anything like this. A major difference between mu'jizah and that mir- the, 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 the miracle of the Prophet of Allah and the magic that they, these people were doing, and right there, magicians realize that what he's doing is not, a, is not a magic. It has to be a miracle, because what happened to our sticks? They all disappeared, and we don't have them. So, there is always a major difference, but many times, common people like us, we cannot differentiate between those. And therefore, we need to have some clear things, and clear proofs that will tell us the difference between the two. And this is why we need to set a common ground. For people who are questioning the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we need them to set us a common ground. Okay, tell us what makes some other people as prophets. What makes you believe in them as a prophet? And believe me, any miracle they can present, or not just miracle, any proof anyone in the world can present, about any of Anbiya alayhimu salatu salam being a messenger of Allah, we have better and stronger proofs about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of the similar kind, of the very similar kind, better and stronger proofs about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being a prophet of Allah. But let us first thing quickly go over what we were talking about in the last session. And I mentioned at that time that we would divide this into five different categories of how do we know about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa being a prophet of Allah or generally how do we know about anyone being a messenger of Allah. But keep this please, keep this very straight and clear in the mind that it's not for anyone after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This is only for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the Anbiya before him and this is to set the common ground between us and those who believe in any of the prophets and messengers, and they have questions about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After going through these five categories, it will be very clear, it will be very clear to everyone, that there is no way for a person to believe in any other messenger. Believe me, no way for any person to believe in any other prophet and messenger, and deny the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No way whatsoever. We can really put the people in a situation and no matter who those people are and how educated they are, in fact, the more they're edu- educated they are, the better it is so that they understand what we are talking about. That if they really believe in anyone being a prophet, 
then there is no way you can deny the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. No reason whatsoever. Whether you come through the ways of objecting against Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, this is a fact, and I'm not just saying it. After a lot of studies, a lot of talking to people, dialogues, and these things, I can, I can, with the full guarantee, I can say this: that if any person, if any person is uh, believes in any uh, pro- in any way is able to prove the prophethood of any prophet of Allah prophet if a person is able to prove the prophethood of any of the anbiya ali musallat wa salam of the past we can prove to him in the very similar way the prophethood of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the second point is also very strongly we believe in it and it's very clear that if anyone presents any objection against islam or against Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam you would find very similar thing done by the previous anbiya alayhi salatu wassalam if you want to object here then you should object there too and if you have no objection there because that's in your book and now you change your glasses when you look in your book you have different glasses and when you look at our book you change your glasses we can't believe that we can't go by that you have to have the same criteria and if you keep the same criteria there is no way you would object against rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and no objection against the other prophets that you believe in very simple example that when people talk about rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam marrying more than one wife I mean, look at the books look at their books that talk about anbiya ali musallatu wassalam doesn't their book say that different prophets had more than one wife how come over there when it's in your book that sulaiman ali salam had 99 wives you totally ignore that and you come to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and object about nine in your book it says 99 wives for a prophet you come and object about uh, about rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam with nine wives in your books, well, Ayazubillah, well, Ayazubillah, well, Ayazubillah, it says that a prophet of Allah who's married, he has daughters, and he, well, Ayazubillah, has affairs with his own daughter, and you have no objection to that. That you view that, that to Lut alayhi salam. That a prophet of Allah is who's married and having affairs with his own daughter, no objection. Here, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam is marrying another woman, and there is objection to that. What's that? What's happening there? Very clearly, you see that wherever they object against Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam or anything, any objection against Islam, you have this very similar thing mentioned about prophets over there in their books. Another example: slavery. And right away, a question comes: How come Islam allows slavery? And the very same people who are objecting against Islam and to this order of Islam, they will tell you, ask them, tell them how many children Ibrahim alayhi salam had. And right away the person will tell you, oh, he had Ismail and Ishaq alayhi salam. Now, who was the mother of Ismail alayhi salam? They will tell you, Hajar. Who was the mother of Ishaq alayhi salam? Sarah radiallahu anha. Was Hajra a wife of Ibrahim alayhi salam or something else? And the Bible says she was not his wife. She was a slave of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And he had a son from a slave woman. This is what their book says. A person who is holding in his hand that book and defending that book and objecting about against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam that why did he allow slavery in Islam? Subhanallah, look at your book, it says that a prophet that you believe in with full respect, he did, he allowed the same thing. Not only that he allowed it, he had it himself. The bottom line is that any objection that they would present against Islam, believe me, there are stronger objections related to the same topic against some people that they are holding in their own books, that they stand for and they try to defend. Then, why all the objections are just coming towards Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? If you want to deny him because of this, then deny the other ones also because of the same reason. 
But if this is not a reason to deny a Prophet of Allah, then if you're accepting those, you accept him also. There is no reason to deny. So anyway, this is, as I said, just to set a common ground for understanding the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So five different categories. Number one is the person, personality of the prophet of Allah, his own personal life. When we look at that person's life, his, character, his characters, his, way of, his uh, way of life, his lifestyle, by what that, that should prove that he is truly a messenger of Allah. This has to be something very common between all the Anbiya alayhi salatu wassalam. And we were talking about this. But I'll come back. Let me quickly just go over the all five categories. Number two, miracles. That we look at the miracles of Anbiya alayhi salatu wassalam because through miracles a person is confirmed that this person has been sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, the prophecies of the Prophet. That a person mentions this, this Prophet of Allah with his claim of prophethood when he says that this is what will happen in the future. This is how these things will happen. And you see the prophecies are turning out to be true. And none of the prophecies turns out to be false. All the prophecies are true. Number four. The mention of this Prophet in the previous books. What did the previous books say about this Prophet? Number five, the teachings of this prophet. What does he teach? And what type of teachings he left for people, for his followers? And how did people benefit from his teachings? These are five different categories. We will go into the details of each of them, inshallah, as inshallah, uh, uh, session by session. But right now, going back to the first category, and that was, the personality of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In that regard, we talked about some portion of it. Very briefly, we talked about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's humbleness. Just that quality by itself is enough to prove his prophethood. But, as I mentioned at that time, we'll just take two examples of it. One is his humbleness, the other is generosity of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And believe me, these are only two examples that we will be choosing out of hundreds of things and beauties that he had in his life. We are only selecting two out of those. So, looking at the generosity of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is hadith in the Sahih. Anas radiyallahu anhu says, Rasulullah, it was known about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that whenever any person asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for anything, he would never say no to anything he was asked for. Ask him for whatever. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would not say no to it. Once, a woman in Medina Munawwara Sahabiya from the Ansar, she saw the dress of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with so many patches on it, she went and she made a new dress for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She came to the masjid, presented that as a gift to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went home, he puts on the new dress, and he folded the old one and puts it aside. At the end, now he comes and he sits with the Sahaba radwanullahi alayhi wa sallam. At the end of it, the, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is about to get up and leave, a sahabi is sitting there, he goes to him and says, Ya Rasulullah, I like your dress, mashallah, it's so nice. He says, yes, alhamdulillah, I just got it as, as a gift today. Ya Rasulullah, can you give it to me? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't say anything, he just stayed quiet. A little later, he goes home, he puts on the old dress and brings the new dress to the Sahabi. He says, take it. It's for you. The other Sahaba that were sitting there in that gathering, they were very upset. They said to this man, you know, he had this new dress after a long time. That lady, poor lady, you know, she worked so hard to prepare this dress for him. 
And now you just ask him to, and you know he doesn't say no to anything. So when you ask him, you should know that he would never say no. And here you take the dress from him. So he says to them, you know, the reason I asked him for it, because, not because I just like a new dress, or I just wanted to just, I said, you know, you get a dress for free. My, my intention was that this would become my kafan when I die. So that's the only reason I asked him for it. So they said, okay, if that's the reason, that's fine then. We accept your reason. This Sahabi, he puts it on and he goes home. And he says to his wife, very happily, look what I have today. And this Sahabi himself, for a long time, he did not have a new dress to put on. So just imagine when after a long time, you go home and everyone in the house sees you, mashallah, with new dress. They will be very happy. He goes home and he says to his wife, Look, I have a new dress. And her first question was, Where did you get it from? This is how sahabiyat are, subhanallah. Where did you get it from? And he says, I got it from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And now, you would be even happier now. MashaAllah, the dress of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kiss it, put it in your head. <laughs> she says, Look at the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how Sahaba Ridwanullah al-Majma'een they learned these adab from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam her question to her husband was halishtakayta allaha ila nabiyyihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did you complain to the Prophet against Allah which means did you tell Prophet that Ya Rasulullah, I didn't have dress for a long time, new dress for a long time. This is complaint against Allah. Did you complain to the Prophet against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah is not giving you a new dress? Which means, her question mainly was pointing towards, did you ask him for it or did you mention your need to it? And then he gave it to you? He said, no, no, it wasn't that. I didn't present any need. All I said, that this was a nice dress, I would like to have it and he gave it to me. She says, in that situation is fine. And he also explained to her that because, because I want this to be my coffin, I'm just putting it, I just put it on to show you, now it's going to come off. And it will stay there, and it's my will that when I die, use it as my coffin. She says, in that situation, alhamdulillah, this is good. And inshallah, you will have the, bla- the barakah of it when you die. But the point is, we're talking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the generosity of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How, this is how he gives. Safwan ibn Umayyah. One of the leaders of Quraysh. A person who is very wealthy. He comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is not Muslim yet. He says, I would like to stay with you for some time. So to see what Islam is all about. And he joins Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the battle of Hunayn. Anas radiallahu anhu says in a hadith which is in Sahih Muslim. At that battle, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave Safwan ibn Umayyah, he gave him 100 camels. You know what 100 camels mean? Even today we cannot afford to give 100 camels, just as a gift, for no reason. You're just giving it to a person, as a gift. It's just like 100 cars. And camels was considered one of the best rides of the, in those days. And believe me, Comparing it with cars is not fair either because you can't eat the car. <laughs> but camels is something, you use it as a ride and you are using it for a mean of sustenance also. It's your risk if you need, whenever you need the meat. And not only that, on daily basis, it's giving you milk. Car is only taking gas from you. <laughs> You're spending on it. But here, it's giving you milk on daily basis. So, it's just like having a small business where you get your income from, you get your food from, and having a ride at the same time. Look at the benefits of it. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gives him 100 camels. A little later, he calls him, he says, 100 more for you. And he takes 200 camels. Anas radiallahu anhu says, a little later, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa called him, and he says, 100 more for you. 300 camels. Right in one gathering, goes to only one person. Uyayna ibn Hassan comes, another leader. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, 100 camels for you. 
and leaders kept on coming one after another. Every person is going either with 100 camels or someone is taking 1,000 goats. Someone is taking a bag full of gold, so heavy that he cannot carry it. He has to bring helpers to carry the bag of gold. These people who got all of these gifts from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, they themselves later on say that at the time when he was giving us, no one was more headed to ask more than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We did not hate any person in this life more than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But he kept on giving and giving. Finally, through his generosity, we realized that he has to be a prophet. A normal person can never give this much. You would think that let me keep it for myself. This is a strength for us. You know, we need a lot of camels. I will give it to my people and we will use it for our country. We will use it for our benefits. But here he's just giving everything out. Imam ibn Habban, rahimahullah, narrated in the Sahih, that a person came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a villager, comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he says, Ya Rasulullah, give me something. I'm in need. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pointed towards a valley, a space between two mountains, a valley full of goats. He says, go and take all of those. And the person couldn't believe. You're telling me take all of those? Yes, all of that's yours. Take it. That person takes all of that. He's, he goes back to his uh, home country, wherever he came from, and he tells his people, uh, advising them, he said, Ya qawm, aslimu, fa inna muhammadan yu'ti ata'a man la yakhshal faqar. Oh my people, I'm advising you to become Muslims, because when Muhammad gives, he gives in such a way, that you know he's not afraid of poverty. He's not afraid of losing it. When he gives, it's, as if you see that, he's sure, he's certain that tomorrow he will have the same thing when he needs it. Which means this is his trust in Allah, and no one other than a Prophet of Allah can have that type of generosity, that he just gives everything that he has. Who would do something like this? After reading all of this, believe me, still we cannot do it. In other hadith, Jabir radiallahu anhu says, or Anas radiallahu anhu says, and this is in Ibn Habban also, it was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kana la yaddakhiru shay'in lighad. He would never save something for the next day. Everything he has, he would spend it today, and next day he would say, if anyone would ask him about it, the next day he would say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave us today, he, he, he can give us tomorrow also. So if he is the giver today, he is the giver of tomorrow. Why do we have to be afraid of losing anything? Umar radiallahu anhu says, that once a person came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and asked him to give him something. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to this person, I don't have anything today. I'm so sorry. I don't have anything to give you today. But, go to such and such person, they are, they, they, they are store owners, and tell them that I sent you to them, take whatever you want from them, and tell them to give me, send me the bill, I'll pay them for it whenever I'll have the money. So Umar radiallahu anhu says, Ya Rasulullah, now this is getting too much. When you have it, you just give it away. Now you don't have it, and the person is asking you, so you're taking the loan from that person, and you're telling him to go and take whatever he wants from that store, and you would pay for it later on, and you don't have no money right now? Ya yeah, Rasulullah, you shouldn't do this. Umar radiallahu anhu himself rings. He said, when I said this, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa got upset. His face started turning red because of anger. He didn't say anything, but right away, a sahabi from the Ansar who was there, and he sensed the whole situation, and he quickly wanted to make up for it. He says, Ya Rasulullah, Anfiq Ya Rasulullah, Wa la takshaw in the arsh iqlala. Ya Rasulullah, keep on spending, and don't be afraid of anything. Allah will keep on giving you more. As soon as he said this, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a big smile on his face. Yes, this is what Allah told me to do. Subhanallah. Look at this generosity. No, no one in the world can think about anything similar to this. That a person would take loan, and will give that person uh, the open way that go and take as much as you want from that store, and I will pay for it. A person comes to our store, 
We will be afraid to tell the person, take whatever you want from my store. And you own all of that. And here, go and take it from that store, and I will pay for it. And he doesn't even know what and how much he's going to take. Aisha radiallahu anha says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was like you people. He, she's trying to say that he was a human being with all of the needs. He was like you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with some qualities. And she says that main quality, his generosity, and then always being smiley. That he, smile, he smiles to every person. You don't see him that he's facing someone with giving a person a bad look. Except if a person would say anything that displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was a time when the, uh, there was famine in Makkah Mukarramah. This is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Madinah. And the kuffar of Quraysh who are opposing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, preparing their armies and spending every penny from their prophet to prepare uh, the armies against uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They, have, they had a famine in Makkah Mukarramah. At that time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent them food on a couple of loads or a couple of camel loads. I mean, food that will be loaded on camel. Camels full of that food and he sent it to Makkah Mukarramah and he said to the person, go and give it to Abu Sufyan and tell him to spend it the way he likes. This person who went there, he says, when I went and gave it to Abu Sufyan, Abu Sufyan puts his head down. He was so ashamed of himself and he said to me that we keep on opposing him and he just keeps on giving us. This is now sending it to his enemies when he sees that they are in difficult situation. In another hadith, Nafi' ibn Jubayr radiallahu anhu says that once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had some wealth and he started distributing and some villagers came and they were asking him for more and more. And they kept on getting more and more. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is just almost being pushed backward. He's standing and he's giving it. And they are pushing him. They are going towards him. Give, it, give me more, give me more. And they are pulling it from his hands. And finally, someone even pulled the sheet of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The sheet that he's covering his upper body with. Someone even took that from him. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, just give me my sheet back. Anything that I have, I'll give it to you. But this is, I need to go to the masjid right now. So just please give me my sheet back. A sahabi <laughs> says, and this is Abdullah ibn Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's narrating. He says, a sahabi came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the battle of Hunayn. This sahabi says, I was wearing slippers that were very hard. During the battle, at one occasion, I happened to be next to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and I moved my leg, my slipper hit the foot of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he started bleeding. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now he was afraid that I haven't seen it, so he hit me. He had a uh, a whip in his hand, so he hit me with the whip with the whip on my leg, uh, and he said, "Keep your leg away." He says, now I was so afraid that I got away from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the evening, after the battle was over, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a person to look for me. When that person came and he told me that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is calling you, I was so afraid that I said, now he's going to tell me, okay, look at what you did. When I went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to me, look, there are 80 um, uh, goats standing over there, that are tied, uh, tied up over there. Take all of these goats and please forgive me for, uh, for me hitting you. So I said, Ya Rasulullah, you didn't do nothing. You just asked me to stay away and I'm the one who hit you, I injured you. He said, yeah, but still, I don't want anyone to come on the day of judgment before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asking me for any of... Uh, his rights on me. This is why just tell me, here, this is a gift for you, and please tell me that you have forgiven me. He said, I said, Ya Rasulullah, sure, I have forgiven you. But look, for just for that, he is giving that person 80 goats. 
and he is going to go Medina, Medina to his own home and doesn't have a single goat at his own home. Not a single goat at his home and he's giving someone 80 goats right there. Aisha radiyallahu anha. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anha says in a hadith which is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ajwad al-nas. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the most generous person in the world. He says, never seen any person more generous than Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we need to remember this. When Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een admiring Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's generosity. This is not simple, something very, we can take it very simple. Because if any of us today, in this day and age, if we have experienced the generosity of Arabs, Believe me, if you have spent any time around people who are truly Arabs, not people like us who spent some years over there, and as soon as we learn how to say Kaifa Hal, we are Arabs. <laughs> That's not the Arabs we are talking about. True Arabs. If you look at their generosity, believe me, they make you feel that everything belongs to you. He doesn't own anything. I have seen with my own eyes a person, this is, I'm talking of these days, a person every day sitting on his musalla after Salat al-Maghrib, doing what? He's sitting with friends and you can go and look at those people. What are they doing? They're just sitting and chatting and playing. This person sitting there and people, whoever knows, knows about him, that you go and tell him about any of your needs. He is going to put his hand under the musalla and bring out hundred dollar bills. He doesn't have smaller bills, only hundred ones. And he brings those out. Okay, how much did you say you need? Five hundred, okay. Five hundred for you. So go. And every day, this is not, I'm, I'm not talking about in Ramadan or Laylatul Qadr or a few days. <laughs> this is every day of his life that we, when he is home, everyone knows his schedule, Maghrib. To almost midnight, he would be sitting there and as many people would go there, go and take as many bills as you want and just take it and go and you don't have to mention your name, he doesn't have to know you, you don't have to present no proofs, just go and take it and again go back in the line and present your need again in the same night and get as many bills as you want. I have seen this with my own eyes. And during the month of Ramadan, subhanallah, don't even ask. People, I have seen with my eyes, people, they have a special window in their homes so that they sit at the window there and anyone passing by, take, 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 and they're just giving bills, 100 bills, bills of 100 reals. And take, just keep on taking. This is of today. And generosity of Arabs generally is well known, is well known. And especially... Now, still, we have, we have been affected by all the other things that we see in the world and uh, everything in our environment has been affecting us and programs and uh, TV and everything, all of these things are affecting us. Still, we see so much generosity there. Imagine what was the level of generosity in those days. Let me just tell you a few examples of it so we can understand the generosity of those people. It was a normal train that if you happen to be a guest of someone, that person would slaughter a goat or a camel for you. Now, next meal, this was well known, next meal, he is not going to feed you from that leftover of the previous meal. He is going to slaughter another goat or another camel for you. Next meal, and stay as many days as you want. And each meal, he is going to slaughter a goat or a camel for you. This was well known amongst Arabs. And if a person would feed you their leftover from the previous one, he is considered to be a very miser person, a person who has no respect for his guest. And doesn't have to be a known guest, any unknown person. You are a guest, that's it. This is what, you, what you're going to get. Their generosity, it's well known, spending, and especially a person who was known, Hatim al-Ta'i. 
his generosity is very, very well known. That this person, there was a famine at a time when there was a famine in their town. He killed his camel and he went and he fed all the people in his town and is sitting on the side just watching them eating and he is feeling happy that people eating it. He doesn't have no more food, no more right. That is the last thing that he owned and he's feeding it to other people. Did not feed, did not eat himself. His wife is sitting there and she asked him if she can take something. He says, not until everyone is done eating and if there is left over, then we will look for it, we will think about it. So at the end, him himself, his wife and his children who were sitting there and crying, they had nothing and he fed everything to other people. And those people who had seen Hatim at tai they used to say that Rasulullah was far more generous than Hatim at tai And this is why after seeing the generosity of Rasulullah people used to say that we haven't seen any person more generous than Rasulullah and this has to be only from a Prophet of Allah. Just this quality of Rasulullah was bringing people into Islam and making them believe and realize that it has to be a miracle. It has to be from a Prophet. Nothing more than that. So now when we say that, Sahaba Ridwanullahi Ali Majma'in, admiring the generosity of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is just is not like me and you saying, Oh mashallah, he's very generous because he gave thousand dollars. For those people giving thousand dollars like this did not mean anything. They used to look at what you give out of things that you need. Sahaba Ridwanullahi Ali Majma'in. As they learn the generosity from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we see Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu giving everything that whatever he owned, he comes and just gives it. Ya Rasulullah, this is sadaqah. What did you leave for your family? He doesn't say nothing. He says, I left Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's name for them. I left the name of Allah and the name of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for them. This is more than what they need. They don't need this money. Aisha radiallahu anha. Of course, she learned all of this from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Once, she receives thousands and thousands as a gift. She received it around the time of Zuhr. She was fasting that day. Before Salatul Maghrib, she had given up everything. So when everything was gone, a woman sitting next to her, she says, you distributed everything. I wish if you would have left something for us so that we can break the fast with. We are fasting today. Oh, you didn't remind me. You didn't remind me earlier that we need something to break our fast with. Not a single day that she left at her home and she spent thousands in the same day. And at the end of the day, she doesn't have even a date at her home to break the fast with. Okay, we will break our fast with water. This is how they learned the generosity from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, when it comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa generosity, uncomparable. No similar examples whatsoever in the history or anywhere in the world. This is what Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu says in this hadith, which is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ajwad al-nas. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was the most generous person in the world. Wa ajwadu ma yakunu fi Ramadan. Hina yalqahu Jibreel. This was his g- generosity in general days. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu says, he used to get even more generous during the month of Ramadan. He used to be even more generous because he is continuously in connection with Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam and they're revising the Quran. During those days, he used to be extremely generous. Now, if he is generous in normal days, this is a generosity in normal, normal days, what would be the generosity in during the month of Ramadan? Subhanallah. You know, just giving up everything. And this is what now we can understand when we read about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spending days not having anything to eat. And sometime a question comes to mind that then what happened to Usman radiallahu anhu, his son-in-law, so close to him, one of our Ashra Mubashira, and he's one of the wealthiest people in Medina. He has, he's the wealthiest person in Medina, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spends three days nothing to eat. How come Osman doesn't send, doesn't send anything to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Abdurrahman ibn Awf is there, Talha ibn radiallahu anhu is there, uh, Zubair ibn Awam is there, so many sahaba have gardens in Medina Munawwara. How come they don't send something to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? 
The point is that they used to send it. Whatever they send, he would just give it out. He would give everything out and at the end of the day when it's time for him to have e, to have his meal, there is nothing at home. So the Sahaba knows that no matter how much he's going to send, it will be distributed out. So they still send, but still everything gets distributed out. Some, in some days, they send... I mean, uh, uh, you, we read in the, some of the hadiths like a Sahabi would go, Ya Rasulullah, 50 goats. And at the, in the evening he comes, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa doesn't have a single goat at his home. Everything is gone. And there is a hadith that explains that. Why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was doing it. He says in the hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not allow me to keep anything while as long as there is any person who needs it in Medina Munawwara. Once Um Salama radiallahu anha had some meat. She knew Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loves meat. So she saved it for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A person came and asked if they have anything to give as a sadaqa. And he said, no. She said, no, I, we don't have. I mean, she didn't say no. She said, uh, may Allah uh, give you. <coughs> Which means, go and look for somewhere else. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came. Very happily she offered that meat to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He looks at it. He says, Um Salama, what is this? She looks at it. It's nothing but a stone. There was a stone in that plate. She says, Ya Rasulullah, I swear that this was a meat. I saved it for you. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa asked her, did anyone come to ask for some food or for anything? For sadaqah? She said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. A person came, knocked on our door, asking for sadaqah. And I said to him, may Allah give you barakah, go and look for it somewhere else. He said, oh, that's the reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not allow me to eat it if it was not given to a needy person. And by all of this, of course, these qualities are so clear, so clear for us to understand the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that a person with this iman, with so much trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only has to be a prophet of Allah. After hearing all of this, how many of us would dare to go home and see if we have, I'm not saying money, okay, that's too difficult. We will not, let's not even talk about it. Go and see that I have 10 pairs of socks. Let me give out five of them as a sadaqah to so people who may, may need it. Five. And if we really think of doing that, which five are we going to take out? <laughs> let me take these. Oh, I wore this enough. I, I don't think I'll wear them again. And uh, subhanAllah, nowadays the situation with the poor people is that if you give them a used cloth, they won't don't want it. This is the poor people of our, our time. So anyway, this, looking at these examples, this has to be only from a Prophet of Allah alayhi salatu wassalam. The only reason I got stuck right now is for a minute in my mind. I just remembered a story about generosity. It may be interesting to share that also. Abdullah ibn Ja'far radiallahu anhu. Abdullah bin Ja'far bin Abu Talib. Ja'far radiallahu anhu was the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The brother of Ali radiallahu anhu. His son Abdullah was known for generosity. And whenever people needed anything, they would go to, they would know, okay, go to Abdullah ibn Ja'far, and he's going to fulfill your need. And really, he was a person, that a person would go to him, and he would ask the in charge, uh, the, he had a person who was in charge of keeping all of his money. So he would ask him, how much do we have? We have a million in our account. Okay, give him, five, uh, give him half of it. This is how he used to give. Sometime, okay, give him that garden. Abdullah ibn Ja'far radiallahu anhu says, once, once, I was traveling, and I saw a dog. A dog was I mean, just passing by, and I didn't pay really too much attention to that. But there was a person who was working as a farmer. He's uh, working in a farm, and I could see by his look that he was a slave. 
a slave that is working as a farmer there. He was sitting and he was about to stand his lunch. So he takes out a bag and he takes a bread out. As soon as this person takes the bread out and is about to eat the bread, he sees the dog going towards him. So he throws the bread to the dog. The dog right away ate the whole bread. This person takes another bread out of his uh, bag and he throws it in front of the dog. And the dog right away, he finished the second bread also. This person gets up and he starts performing salah. After he finished his salah, he went back to his work. So Abdullah ibn Ja'far says, I went to the span and I asked him, I said, how much food do you get every day? First thing he looked at me, and then I told him, you know, I'm Abdullah ibn Ja'far and he's a well-known person. Okay, I get two bread every day. Okay, if you don't mind me asking you, that today I saw you giving both of your bread to that dog. What was the reason? He said, when I looked at the dog, I could see that this is a strange dog. We don't have these type of dogs in our town. And by looking at it, I could see that this dog must have come from another town, from neighboring cities or neighboring towns. And if he traveled all the way from there to here, this dog must be very hungry. So I gave him both the breads. So Abdullah ibn Jafar asked, he says, I asked him, that then what are you going to do now? He says, brother, this dog, may I don't know for how many days he didn't have anything to eat. For me, inshallah, in the evening I will get something to eat. So all I have to do is just start for one time, not have anything to eat for one time. Inshallah, by the evening I will have something, but I don't know what the dog, where the dog is going to go by the evening. So I decided to give him everything. Abdullah ibn Ja'far says, I was so ashamed of myself that everyone knows me as a generous person. And here this person, this poor man, who gets only two pieces of bread and he doesn't have anything else, doesn't own anything else. Now he is going to continue doing all of his hard work till the evening without any food. So I asked him, what was the name of his master? He told me the name. I went to the person. And I asked that person, I said, is that garden, does that farm belongs to you? He said, yes. The person who works over there, is he a slave? Yes. Can you sell me the person and the garden? He says, why? Abdullah ibn Ja'far radiallahu anh explained the whole situation to him, the whole story, he tells, he tells him the whole story, that this is I saw about the generosity of this man, and I was so impressed, and I said to myself, you know, a person like him, should, we should give him something. He, should, he deserves some gift now from me. And this is why I would like to buy the garden set, I will, I'm going to pay for him, so he's free, I will set him free, and I would like to buy the garden and give it to him as a gift. So the owner of the garden said to me, that if you really want to do something like this, and get all the reward, why not I do it, because it's still I own it. <laughs> so he says to me, wait a minute, can you wait for a minute? I said, okay. So he made me wait over there, he goes home, little later he comes out with his sons, and he says to me, that you be my witness, that person is free, the garden is his, I'm giving it to him as a gift. And the reason I went home was to ask my daughter if she would accept to marry him. And she accepted it. And now you be the witness that I am marrying my daughter to him. <laughs> the question now, who is more generous? Out of the three there. Who is the most generous person out of the three? Subhanallah. You know, this is the generosity. This is the generosity. That a person who comes into Islam, he's new into the deen, but after spending some days in this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he learned about the generosity of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he sees the generosity of Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi this is how generous this person becomes, that he gives up all of his food to a dog. Anyway, that was one way of looking at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's prophethood, and that is looking at the personal, personal, personal life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his personality. The second thing is miracles. When we look at the miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they are very clear that 
by looking at the miracles, there is no way, no way whatsoever anyone can deny the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Maybe interesting for us to know that when people believe in other prophets and they present miracles to us, mainly those are the people of Ahlul Kitab, Christians and Jews. From their books, they will present some miracles. And a lot of time, the miracles of Isa alayhi salam become very impressive for us that, mashallah, look, these type of miracles, alhamdulillah, great miracles. But let me quickly, quickly give you a quick comparison of miracles here. When you look at the Old Testament, the total number of miracles in Old Testament is 67 miracles. This is the total number of miracles in Old Testament. The total number of miracles in the New Testament, what do you think would be the total number? We said 67 in the Old Testament. The New Testament, of course, has miracles of Isa his, uh, from his birth, miraculous birth, and then a lot of miracles of Isa alayhi salam. So from his birth until when he was about 33 years old, and he was left by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the heavens. How many miracles do you, do you think may be there in the New Testament, including all of these miracles of Isa alayhi salatu wa salam? And it may be surprising to some of us to know that altogether, the, new, the miracles in the New Testament are 27 miracles. That's all. 27 miracles. How many miracles do we know of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The ones that we know about him from Quran or in the light of a hadith that we have for the continuous chain of narrators. We are not talking about a book that we don't know where it comes from. We are talking about a book that talks with a complete chain of narrators. How many miracles do we know about him? Imam Siyuti rahmatullahi alayhi. Imam Siyuti rahmatullahi alayhi wrote a book called al khasais al-Kubra in which he have mentioned 1,000 miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam Nawawi rahimahullah says that Imam Suyuti have missed many and there are about 1,200 miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 1,200 miracles. Now, when we look at these miracles, each of these miracles may have hundreds of miracles within it. For example, when you count 1,200 miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa one of those miracles is Qur'an. And now you start looking at the miracles of Qur'an. Just within the Qur'an itself, you have thousands, not hundreds, believe me, thousands of miracles within the Qur'an. In fact, in reality, each and every ayah of Qur'an is miraculous. Why? Because the challenge to the world is, bring an ayah like the ayah of Qur'an. So each and every ayah of Qur'an is a challenge to the world, that this is a miraculous ayah, bring something like it. That's 6,666 miracles. Without going into the meanings of it. So, and in this regard, if we look at the miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, believe me, impossible for us to have exact count of the miracles, because if each miracle has so many miracles within it, then how can we keep an account of, uh, account of all of these miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let me just give you a few examples before we end, and then inshallah in our next sessions we will go into the details of these miracles. But few examples today about the miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam Bukhari and Muslim rahimahullah have narrated, on the authority of Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he says once, I didn't have anything to eat for three days. I was extremely hungry. That day a person came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he gave him a glass of milk as a gift. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam called me, Abu Hir, come. I went with him, and I saw the glass of milk, I was so happy. <coughs> After three days, you're going to get something to eat today, or at least something to drink, other than water. So he says, I was very happy that now he called me, means he's going to give me the milk. He says, Abu Hurairah, go and call the people of the sofa. So he says, I was so hungry, but... Of course, no choice but to obey Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And this shows the extreme obedience of Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa If we are sitting and eating, 
and we tell our children to go and get something and the child is hungry, well, they, Dad, I'm too hungry right now. Or the least is he's going to give you a good look. <laughs> and here, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, who's been starving for three days. Abu Huraira, go and call the people of Sufa. Now he goes out. And in this hadith, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu says that I knew once I would go and call them, so I would be considered the host, so he's going to give them first and I would be the last. But that was the order, so I went for it. And when I started calling all the people of Sufa, do we know how many people were in Sufa? 300 people in the Sufa. He says, I started looking for them and called them, and they all started gathering over there. When I, they came, and I went back to Rasulullah wasallam, it was the same thing that I was afraid of. He told me, Abu, so Abu Huraira, take the glass and start passing it on. And I look at the glass, and all of these people sitting there, so I knew there is no way that I will get my turn from this. Okay, I started passing it on. And I keep on passing it from one to the next person to the third person. And Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu says, after all of them had that milk, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa held a glass in his hand and he looked at me and he was smiling. He says, Abu Huraira, now it's you and me. I said, Sadaqta ya Rasulullah. Yes, that's true ya Rasulullah. So he said to me, okay Abu Huraira, go ahead. You take first now. You drink. So I had some and then I stopped. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said to me, drink more. So I drink more. I stopped. Abu Huraira, drink even more. And I drink more. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, again now, Abu Huraira, drink even more. Abu Huraira radiallahu says, I said, Ya Rasulullah, now I believe I have no room, no more room to drink anymore, Ya Rasulullah. After that, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, got the glass in his hand and he drank himself. From one glass, 300 people drinking the milk, from one glass. And it's enough for everyone and still there is left over. And there are hundreds of these type of miracles in the hadith that are about barakah in the food and barakah in, uh, in, in the drink. Imam Bukhari rahimahullah have narrated on the authority of Jabir radiallahu anhu. He says, we went to Hudaybiyah. The kuffar blocked all the wells of Hudaybiyah so that we won't have no water. There was only one dry well over there. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was told that there is no water. 1400 people, they are out of water. And there is no way that they can get to any water around that area. The kuffar have blocked all the wells that were around there. Jabir radiallahu anhu says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked us, does anyone has any water at all? A sahabi said, Ya Rasulullah, I have very little water in a small container. He said, bring it to me. I took that to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he placed, he placed his blessed hands in that container, and water started gushing from between the fingers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jabir radiallahu anhu says, now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave us that container of water, and he said, go ahead and give it to every person who would like to use any water. So we started drinking from it, and because it was from the blessed hands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that was the most blessed water in the world. So he said, we started drinking as much as we could, we started feeding our camels, and some people started taking shower also from that, and wudu from that, and at the end there was left over in that container. So the person, well, the student of Jabir radiallahu anhu asked him, how many people were there? Jabir radiallahu anhu says, we were about 1400 of us. 1,400 people using the water from that small container. And this is nothing but a miracle, and a clear miracle that proves that every time, whenever they are in need, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfills their need. The hadith is in Bukhari. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was giving a lecture. A person came, this is on the day of Jum'ah. He is on the member, and a person comes in. He says, Ya Rasulullah, halakat al Ya Rasulullah, all of our kettles are dying. Uh, we are starving. Lands are dry. There is no water. Please pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that at least we have some water, some rain. Anas radiallahu anhu says, 
Right there, Rasulullah raised his hands and he started making dua. Anas radiallahu anhu witnesses. He says, there wasn't no cloud in Medina or around Medina at all. We looked around, there is no cloud whatsoever. And on the other hand, we look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa hands, his hands are up and he's making dua. And while he's making dua and praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we see cloud coming out of nowhere. And within no time, the whole sky, the whole horizon was full of cloud. And it started raining. And it started raining so heavy that everyone was running out of the masjid so that they can get to their home quickly. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was standing there and smiling. And it kept on raining and raining and raining until next Jum'ah. Next Jum'ah the same man comes in. Says, Ya Rasulullah, there is so much water we don't know what to do with it. Pray to Allah to stop the rain now. Anas radiallahu anhu says, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, again, he raised his hands, made the dua, and then he started pointing his finger towards the skies. And his dua was, Allahumma hawalayna wa la alayna. He goes round, circles his finger uh, on, on top of him. He says, Allahumma hawalayna wa la alayna. Ya Allah, keep it around us, but not on us. Anas radiallahu anhu says, as he's pointing with his finger, as if he is cutting the cloud with his finger. The cloud is just getting cut and it became like a circle all around there. All that circle opened up and it was raining around Medina but nothing in Medina. If he was not a prophet of Allah, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would accept his dua like that? <clears throat> Kill your signs that it could be nothing but a prophet of Allah. The hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting with the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een. Abu Jahl, As bin Wa'il, and other leaders of Quraysh approached Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they said, Oh Muhammad, it's been going now for a long time that you claim the prophethood and we are denying it. And nothing up to this day have proven to us that you are a prophet. Okay, what do you want now? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked them, What do you people want now? We want you to show, show us a miracle that will convince us. Okay, you tell me what miracle do you want. How about you split the moon into two pieces? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. While they are all there, he's sitting there. And the hadith says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pointed towards the finger and he says to them, Unzuru, look at that. And they saw that the moon has been split into two pieces. And as if one piece on the other side, the other is not only that there is a cut, and there is some confusion there. Two pieces, and they say Medina was between the two pieces. One on this side, the other is on the other. Makkah is in between the two pieces. One on this side, the other piece on the other side. The hadith, the wording of the hadith says that these people started wiping their eyes, looking again. Is this is what we see? Is it true? Was he really able to do this too? They came with the intention that they will reject him, will make fun of him. There is no way he can do this. And they look at it again and again. They see the same thing. And again, they'll keep on wiping their eyes and looking back and forth, back and forth. And finally they say, oh, he did some magic on our eyes. So some of them who were there, they said, you know, okay, if he did any magic to us, how about people, uh, some of our travelers who are out of town, how about we ask them if they have seen anything like this? So they started asking people, the travelers that were arriving Makkah Mukarramah, have you people seen anything like this? And all of them are saying, yes, we saw something like this, but we don't know where it was from. Why, how, it, how did it happen? But yes, we, they all witnessed that they had seen it. Abu Jahl at the end says, that it looks like that his magic is done on the moon, not on our eyes. <laughs> this is why everyone was able to see the two pieces of moon, that the magic was done on the moon. For people who don't want to accept, they will never accept. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept the hidayah away from the person, then of course the doors of the hidayah are closed. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really have opened, kept the doors of the hidayah open for a person, and a person comes with an open mindness and looks at the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and all the proofs about the Prophet of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is no way whatsoever for anyone to be able to deny the Prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is how obvious, this is how clear it is. It was 
a time when someone, there was a challenge where all the people of different religions were supposed to present a miracle of their prophet. So different people started, started coming and presenting miracles of their prophets. When it was the time for the Muslim to present his miracle, or present the miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that person came up, that Muslim scholar, when he came up on the stage, he said to them, I'm so surprised what you people are talking about to us is just a joke. What you have been talking about for us, this is nothing but a joke. That you're saying, oh, one, a person comes, you know, once upon a time, our prophet did something like this. Once upon a time, our prophet, and a person comes, yeah, our prophet did this. And a third person comes, he says, our prophet did this. He says, I don't know what you people are talking about. What are the sources? What is the authenticity of it? And did it really happen or not? So therefore, now I would like to tell everyone here in this gathering that if we really want to talk about miracles of our prophets, then every person must present a miracle that is still in existence. And I, as a Muslim, I'm presenting Quran as a miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now it's your turn that all of you come and present a living, an existing miracle of your Prophet. No one came up, and who could come to present a miracle that is still existing, except of the miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? And inshallah, once we will go into the detail, we will find out. That Quran is not the only miracle that is still existing. There are many more. There are many more miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that are still existing. Inshallah, we will talk about the details of these miracles in our next sessions. Aqulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa'ir al-Muslimin wa al-Muslimat wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.